Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 regular City Council meeting of April 10th, 2024. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Arias. Here. Councilmember Weir. Here. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. Councilmember Gray. Here. Councilmember Core. Here. Thank you. We have the pleasure tonight of having Dr. Donald Baird, who's the pastor of First Presbyterian Church, our neighboring church, to lead us in the invocation. Welcome from Sacramento and from Paso. We're glad to have you. And then following the invocation, Councilmember Smith will lead us in the pledge. Would you please stand? tonight with prayer and a, a recognition that, that God is the Lord of all of us. So let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, we come before you with gratitude. We thank you for being a God of love who is with us even now here in this room. You never leave us or forsake us. Your grace has brought us safe thus far, and your grace will lead us home. We thank you for making each one of us in this room one of your people, a citizen of this city and of every city. We see your presence. We thank you, O oh God, for being the God of meetings, of government, of all things. We thank you tonight, God, for those, your servants, our mayor, our city clerk, our vice mayor, our city staff, our city council members. And I thank you for the way of service that they have chosen to take up on behalf of all of us. We all come to this room tonight as complex human beings carrying burdens, carrying joys and hopes, trusting that you alone can hold us together in your love and in your peace. Help us, Lord, to trust you more and more more than our fears and more than our wounds and even more than our accomplishments. May we lean on your everlasting arms tonight. God, in your word, you make clear all of your expectations of us, and by your spirit, we've experienced the fullness and fulfillment of those very things. And so we pray that you would be glorified tonight through the decisions of the city council. We pray that we would have the eyes to see how our lives are all connected, how our common good is upheld when we listen and respond to those most vulnerable. We pray that your kingdom would come here in Bakersfield as it is in heaven through your power working in each one of us, your servants. And may your truth be revealed. May your light shine brighter. May the voices of those most silenced be heard loud and clear. Defend us all, O Lord, through your governing power and authority, through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and you may be seated. And Pastor, you're welcome to leave at this point if you have other things to do. If there aren't enough of seats, I think there's some open staff seats over there. It, it, just go ahead and fill those in if you can't find a seat. Uh, but before we start, we just need to have everybody seated for uh, fire protection for all of us. Just going to wait until everybody's seated.
Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. For safety reasons and as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber or in the lobby. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not during other portions of the meeting. Everyone in attendance is expected to adhere to the rules of decorum established by resolution of the city council. Failure to abide by the city's rules of decorum, including any disruptive behavior that interferes with our ability to have an orderly and efficient meeting, prevents the city council from conducting the business of the city. Consider this a first warning to everyone in attendance that conduct that disrupts this meeting may result in your removal from the meeting and or the chambers being cleared. Behavior that disrupts the meeting includes repetitive statements, shouting, interrupting staff or presenters during the meeting, speaking out of turn, outbursts from the audience, and surpassing the two-minute time limit. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public uh, statements. Thank you. In keeping with the council's new resolution, public statements are now received at different times depending on the item. I will call on the city clerk to call for public statements at the appropriate time, so please listen carefully for the correct time to speak. If you wish to make a public statement, please fill out a public speaker card and place it on the counter in that uh, box right there. We ask that you mark whether you're here to speak on an item listed on tonight's agenda or in a matter not on the agenda. Speakers who do not identify a specific agenda item will be presumed speakers for the non-agenda portion of the meeting. If you're here to speak on an item not listed on the meeting agenda, you will be called first to speak. Statements are given a two-minute time limit per speaker, 20 minutes total for non-agenda item public statements. If you're here to speak on an item listed on the agenda, I will call for you at a later time, so please listen carefully. If public statements become disruptive, and I have to clear the chambers to regain order of the meeting, you will be called in one at a time to provide your public statement when your item is called. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items not listed on the agenda? Mayor Go, we have 28 speakers for items not listed on tonight's agenda. The first three public speakers are Randy Benson, Alexandra Brown, and Sandra Placencia. We have a lot of people who want to make comments. We have 20 minutes total for our public statements, so I'll just ask you to be <clears throat> considerate so we can get through as many people. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Randy Benson. I work for Colombo Construction Company here in Bakersfield, California. I'm a member of the Bakersfield Carpenters Local 743. Am I okay to oh, yeah. start here? Please. Uh, I would like to talk about our tax fraud days of action. Uh, it is estimated that construction fraud is responsible for cheating communities out of $8.4 billion in tax revenue each year. Uh, that's billions of dollars in t uh, lost revenue that could be used for building and renovating schools, caring for veterans, sheltering the homeless, repairing roads, and funding other essential public programs. The prevalence of construction industry tax fraud has reached crisis levels and must be stopped. This April 13th through the 19th, Local 743 and the United Brotherhood of Carpenters are taking part in the National Tax Fraud Days of Action. This is a week-long series of events to raise awareness about tax fraud in the construction industry. This week of activism grew out of the widespread outrage caused by the negative effects of the tax fraud cost upon our communities, families, and friends. This fraud is characterized by a range of practices where employers use criminal practices to avoid tax responsibilities. These developers and contractors intentionally misclassify workers as independent contractors, pay workers in cash, and exploit vulnerable workers. These business bypass legal regulations and ethical standards, giving them a competitive edge over their law-abiding counterparts. This unethical business model is <clears throat> comparable to human trafficking because it targets vulnerable demographics and forces victims to live in an underground economy with little to no chance of getting out. 
This class of worker are affected in a series of unfortunate ways. In a few examples, a proof of income is essential for making significant financial transactions, such as renting an apartment or buying a car. Uh, there's no income paper trail for under the table cash payments. Second, this kind of financial servitude destroys a Ms. worker's- Mr. Benson, your time is up. Can you bring your comments to a close, please? Just I've wrap up. An, an, another paragraph, is that okay? Just a sentence, please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's more important now than ever to hold these criminal employers accountable for stealing from the residents of Bakersfield and to bring justice to the workers that they exploit. Thank you, Thank council you, Mr. members, Benson. for your time. Next speaker, please. Alexandra Brown, followed by Sandra Placencia, followed by Timothy Sheenan. Welcome. Let's just give uh, this group an opportunity to leave. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a biology student in the master's program at CSU Bakersfield, uh, researching human impacts on aquatic environments and animals. And I'm here to speak asking the city to be more proactive regarding preserving sufficient flow of the Kern River throughout the city to maintain the life and ecosystem that it supports. I've spent a lot of time at the river for personal recreation, but also participating in trash cleanups with Bring Back the Kern, and additionally in my capacity as a student of ecology, uh, studying freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater is one of, if not the most valuable resources we have on our planet. Conversion of natural landscapes for human uses and overconsumption of these resources leaves them degraded beyond recognition and unsuitable for community use. And of course, there is economic reliance upon fresh water. Municipal and agricultural water use are essential and the livelihoods they support are important. But I challenge you to accept that the cultural, recreational, and natural use of fresh water is just as important. Fresh water is a commons that should be accessible for all uses by all life forms. Having a majority of the water in fenced in canals throughout town is harming life. Preventing sufficient flow throughout the city is harming life. Prioritizing a bottom line over the community's pleas is harming life. And historically, management of the Kern River has been harming life. I urge the city to consider what proper and responsible stewardship of such a valuable community resource as the Kern River looks like. The injunction has given the city of Bakersfield an important charge. I hope that my words remind you that it's pivotal to consider all uses of the river by our community in the capacity of sustaining and enhancing life. I'd also like to encourage you to read CACB ASI's newly passed SB202 resolution calling for a ceasefire and condemning human rights violations and war crimes. I also invite you to attend the Bring Back the Kern cleanup this Saturday at the Bakersfield Environmental Studies area with CACB. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next speaker, please. Sandra Placencia, followed by Timothy Sheehan, followed by Wendell Wesley. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, my name is Sandra Placencia and I'm a current policy advocate with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Uh, Leadership Council strives to eradicate injustice, advocate for sound policy, and secure equal access to opportunity for all. We are here today to ask the city to introduce a resolution for the eviction prevention program. The resolution must describe the scope of the program, timeline for proposed implementation, and a commitment to fund the pilot program in the adoption of the 24-25 city budget. We know that 37% of households within the city of Bakersfield are cost burden, 41% of households have habitability issues, and Central and Southeast Bakersfield are the most at risk of displacement. Housing continues to be an issue throughout the city, impacting, impacting disadvantaged communities the most. Last year, the city set aside 350000 during the city budget to start the eviction prevention program. Now, almost a year later, this, this program has still not started. 
The delay in starting this program has led to many families, seniors, residents who are, who are disabled facing an eviction and ultimately losing their home due to not having the resources they need. It is heartbreaking to get a phone call from a parent or a senior facing an eviction knowing that ultimately our city does not have the resources to help them. The funding is there but not the program. There have been over 2,500 evictions filed in Kern County since June of 2023. How many of those families would still like to be in their home had this program been up and running once the funding was allocated a year ago? We ask for action and leadership now. We urge the city to adopt a resolution to establish an eviction prevention program at the May 8th, 2024 City Council meeting. The resolution must describe the scope of the program, the timeline, proposed implementation, and a commitment to fund the pilot program in the next city budget. We strongly urge the city to include Right to Council as a program under the Bakersfield Six Cycle Housing Element. Adopting Right to Council as a program can help the city meet their duty to affirmatively further fair housing by providing a place-based strategy to prevent displacement and homelessness. Furthermore, complying with the housing element will meet compliance and open the door for future funding opportunities from the state for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Placencia. Next speaker, please. And just a reminder to the audience that clapping, snapping isn't a part of what we do over here. Um, Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Timothy Sheehan, followed by Wendell Wesley, followed by Roman Matera. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Timothy Sheehan, um, and I'm here to represent the uh, right to counsel. I'm one of those people that got evicted and, and couldn't get help um, attorneys. Um, I mean, they, I, I was, they did change my locks, they changed everything. I called, I've called five, six different attorneys. I went to GBLA, they gave me a number. Um, that number never called me back. I called, and then I, so I started calling up in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area, were, they were all over it to help me. But once, they, once I told them I was in, you know, gave my address to Kern County, they uh, said, oh, we can't help you. Um, I had somebody down in LA, the same thing. They said they'd help me, but I had to get down there to help them. But nobody here in Kern County could help. I've, uh, since uh, the eviction and the harassment, um, I ended up losing, I was on Section 8 at the time, and because I got evicted, I ended up losing my Section 8 um, because they wanted to come in and change my locks and do it. Um, anyhow, um, it just, I don't want somebody else to be, to have that happen to them, what happened to me, because I'm still trying to recover from that right now, still trying to find a home, you know, um, and trying to figure out how to make it. So um, that's, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Vice Mayor. Mr. Sheehan, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your testimonial. I think what, what you're, Experiencing is ex experienced by many folks in our community, and I think we need to uh, participate in some sort of response. Um, Ms. Placencia, thank you again for uh, speaking and being a proactive community member. I always appreciate your comments. Um, Mr. Clegg, I'd like to ask if you can provide the full council an update on our uh, $350,000 that we've allocated for uh, eviction protections last fiscal year and what the status is uh, in your weekly memo so we can get an update. And then also, if we can uh, refer this item related to a resolution to the uh, Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome, please introduce Welcome. yourself. Welcome, hello, my name is Wendell Wesley Jr. Um, I live at California Avenue Senior Housing, um, Mayor, City Council, city management. Um, I'm here to tell you that I started the Bakersfield Tennis Union because at our senior complex, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, they gave us all a $100 rent increase. I knew that was illegal, so I reached out. We got it rescinded. Since then, after starting that union, um, I've seen countless numbers of individuals being wrongfully evicted. One corporate company called Clemmer & Clemmer, now Clemmer Co., um, was actually fined and uh, had to give restitution to tenants over $93,000 worth. There are a lot of very wrong, unjustified seniors and families being evicted. And when they complain about mold, they get basically told, you need to stop complaining or you're going to be evicted. You know, we should not be the city that have slumlords, okay? There are a lot of good landlords here. We do not need slumlords. I love landlords when they uh, abide by the law. We all love good citizens, and we should be that type of uh, city that supports 
and represents all the people, no matter what they do for a living. And so uh, we need to take this and really run with it. Um, we like to see this resolution pass moving forward. And um, we also need a lot more funding if we're gonna make it work, because we are gonna need a, a law firm eventually, and that's gonna cost $2 million. And um, also for those families being evicted, living in other areas um, outside of where they are right now in these high crime areas is very harmful to families. So um, I've also would love you guys to really have a conversation and see what inclusionary zoning would look like. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. Next speaker, please. Roman Matera, followed by Irvin Pike, followed by Jose Garcia. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Roman Matera. I've lived here uh, on and off for about 20 years. Um, you may be familiar with me. I was here at the earlier meeting and I've tried to go to the committee meetings. And um, I'd actually like to do two things in this speech. One, I'd like to echo the sentiments of the uh, prior three speakers who have spoken about the need for strong eviction protections and right to counsel. Um, the story is frankly heartbreaking. And as someone who has himself experienced and is in fact currently experiencing homelessness, I think that tenant rights are a very crucial part, especially amidst a housing crisis. But I'd also like to speak to the, um, the part of the underlying issue. Why, you know, when we think about markets like the way that housing normally is, and you know, we think about landlords raising prices, normally, um, you know, we've been taught that they should get outcompeted. There should be other landlords who are lowering the prices, and we're not really seeing that. I think the reason why is because right now, housing is experiencing a market failure due to a range of policies ranging from the way we tax property to uh, the way we zone that really only incentivizes um, upper middle class single family home developments. And I think that this is a mistake. Now, there's a lot that could be done here to address these problems, and if you ever catch me outside of the meeting, I'm, you know, I talk about it all the time. But I think a very major opportunity is presented to us. On that speaker card, I wrote down, and as you've likely heard in the news, that the 99 cent store is gone bankrupt and is preparing to close and sell its locations. I have spoken before about like when this has happened before with Bed Bath & Beyond, and right now on Stockdale in California, there is an abandoned building where there are also lots of homeless people around there. To make it brief, the city should acquire this land, develop that property with mixed-use principles in mind for the common good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matera. Next speaker, please. Mr. Pike. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, my name's Irvin Pike. Um, I'm here just to show my appreciation and that I am very proud of our mayor, Karen Go, and the city council members to serve our city. Um, due to the intimidation that you've been facing for the last few meetings and the name calling and the rudeness of our fellow citizens here. And I just, um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you guys. And I think it's really good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pike. Next speaker, please. Jose Garcia, followed by Rich O'Neill, followed by Veronica Monterosa. Monterosso. Just, if you could just wait a minute till uh, our guests are seated. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jose Juan Garcia. I'm a current student at CUCB majoring in biology. I'm here to vocalize the need for a more proactive approach toward the conservation of the Kern River. This need intensifies as temperatures keep increasing. These details and execution of how to achieve said conservation need to be incorporated in a city climate action plan. Although previously abandoned and extensive and te tedious as it is, it's fundamental to set the guidelines that steward our local ecology and thus our way of living. I strongly emphasize the way of living because the river supports such an intense and large biodiversity of plants, insects, animals, etc. This includes endangered critters like the San Joaquin kit fox. 
Aside from being a lifeline to our biodiversity, many people in and out of Bakersfield have a genuine appreciation, appreciation of the Kern River. It's why outdoor recreation is popular within the parks near the Kern River. Additionally, the livelihood of many people is strongly interconnected with the river, and this includes socialization, recreation, health, volunteering, research opportunities, etc. The river is a staple of Bakersfield that must be protected. Adjacently, we cannot have environmental justice without justice in all regards, and this includes human rights. With over 41,000 Palestinians killed and more than 77,000 injured, ex excluding those missing, how can we call it a conflict? When homes, hospitals, clinics, educational facilities, places of worship, stores, etc., are bombed, can we call this a just response? When basic necessities are deprived with the intention of foster disease, starvation, and death, can we really call this deserving? When over 15,300 children are killed, better yet, when the generations that we consider our future are being wiped from the face of this planet, are we willing to delude ourselves that this is a norm that we should blindly accept? No, I absolutely detest these inhumane acts of violence. With that, my support extends to my Palestinian brothers and sisters who have been deeply impacted by the ongoing genocide. There needs to be an act of resolution that calls for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza that simultaneously condemns the human rights violations that have transpired. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Next speaker, please. Rich O'Neill, followed by Veronica Monterosso, followed by Rudy Patel. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Good evening. Mayor Go, City Council, and staff. Um, my name is Rich O'Neill, and I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of the Bring Back the Kern, a local organization, nonprofit. We want to thank you uh, for allowing uh, water down our river. Um, I was out there yesterday. There's 200 CFS flowing down that river. Use a lot of citizens using the, the river corridor. I think I saw a city councilman riding his bike down between Trucks and Lake and the river. Big smile on his face. I didn't see any mayors, but I know she's been on all those cleanups. And we, we got another one coming up on this Saturday at 9 o'clock. We'll meet at the finish line. Businesses are happy with the quality of life that, that we've created by allowing water down the river. Bikers are happy. Families are buying their picnic supplies, picnicking along the river. Joggers, horsemen, the restaurants are full along the river, building business. Again, I just want to thank you all, and uh, thank you for improving the quality of life of the citizens of Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Next speaker, please. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Veronica. I live in Ward 6. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Right to Counsel program. I find it a bit appalling that our representatives haven't been able to adequately use the funds for this program to be in place, especially taking into account that there's been a call from the community for this eviction protection program for so long. I'd like to share a bit of my story. I got married a couple years ago. I moved into an apartment with my husband. I paid first and last month's rent in an apartment. Um, the duplex was sold during the pandemic with the housing craze. It, it was sold for a profitable margin. Um, the apartment is now run by a predatory uh, property management company that's been running here in Kern County for several years. Um, they've, been, they've operated under at least two different names. Um, some of their predatory practices is that they rent, uh, switch tenants for, from regular leases to month-to-month -month leases uh, so that they can evict them whenever it is easily accessible or for them or whenever they want to increase the rent. Uh, they ignore work orders and mark them as completed even though they do nothing about them. They raise the, the rent drastically at will and obviously if you can't pay it, then you're threatened with eviction. And with, they tell you that if you don't pay your rent, you're gonna be giving us a 72 hour notice and it's gonna go to collections, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've been able to avoid eviction because I've been paying the exorbitant rent increases and repaying months rent that I shouldn't have to repay. Um, and I feel that I can stand up for myself pretty well, but I can only imagine other people who have been in my place and they don't have 
the um, English. They, don't, they can't speak English, sometimes not even Spanish because they speak another dialect. Um, or they're undocumented. Or whatever, for whatever reason, they can't speak up for themselves. They can't pay the rent increases that I've been able to pay for. Um, and this is going on in our community and nothing has been done about it. And I consider you, uh, I would, wrapping up, to do something about this program and properly run it so that even undocumented people can have access to this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montorosa. Next speaker, please. Please introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi there, my name is Riddhi Patel. I'm here to speak in support of the City Council introducing a ceasefire resolution, specifically the one um, United Liberation Front um, has drafted. I don't have faith that you'll do this. You guys are all horrible human beings and Jesus probably would have killed you himself. And the thing is though, it's very clear to me as in someone who's been an organizer for the past couple of years, that none of you care because you, you guys don't care about anything happening in Palestine or any other country where oppression occurs because you don't care about the oppression occurring here. That's why 40% of current workers don't earn a living wage. That's why the median wage is $30,000. That's why 2,300 people have been evicted in the last year alone because of your failures. That's why the carpenters here were speaking behind me when Bob Smith himself and his son's stupid real estate company, Sage Equities, has been fined $1.3 million by the California Labor Commission for stealing wages from the Carpenters Union. It's why you won't give leadership counsel right to counsel, which Bakersfield residents deserve, and you won't even fund it properly. You'll give it scraps while you give the police, literally a murderer, millions of dollars, while residents who've been evicted that are literally here telling you they've been evicted, you can't give them money to even get the bare minimum of right to counsel. And when the city budget comes up this summer, I know that you guys will vote to increase police funding. And I understand that you guys are all horrible people. But the thing is, 2,300 people being evicted in the last year, those are votes. And you guys, those are votes to win here in Bakersfield. And while you, you guys parade Gandhi around as a Hindu holiday called Chaitra Navratri it starts off this week, I remind you that these holidays that we practice, that other people in the Global South practice, believe in violent revolution against their oppressors. And I hope one day somebody brings the guillotine and kills all of you motherfuckers. Thank you. And with that, that is the end of the public comment period for this section. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items listed on the agenda? Mayor Go, we have received six speaker cards regarding items listed on tonight's agenda. The first three public speakers are Ashley Vegas regarding item 7D1. Uh, Martin regarding item 7D1, and Yas regarding item 7D1. We're now moving to the public statements listed on the agenda. Yeah. Um, before we move to this, I'm sorry, I missed your I request just, to speak. I just wanted to clarify. I don't, I don't know where that information came from, but it is false. Thank you. Thank you. As we move to the public statements, listed on the agenda. If you're here to speak on items listed under consent calendar item seven, your time to speak is now. Again, each speaker is given a two minute time limit and each agenda item is limited to 20 minutes total. The consent calendar as a whole constitutes one agenda item. If you're here to speak on hearing item 9A, now is not the time to speak. You'll be given an opportunity to speak when the item is called later in the meeting. Uh, so at this point, uh, we are taking public speakers regarding items listed on consent calendar item seven. Welcome and go ahead. I'd first like to begin by uh, requesting the council pull this item from the consent calendar. Also, I'd like to request that this, these flyers be distributed to all the council and city manager right now. Um, I find it incredibly disturbing that for the past six meetings, the city has neglected to introduce a ceasefire resolution as requested by constituents, but was so quick to introduce this resolution that will require all persons Madam? 
That item is not listed on our agenda. This portion of the meeting now is for items that are part of the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want? Can I I'm please sorry. reclaim my time? Can I start over? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank Can you. Can you just give Thank her some you. more time? Yeah. All right. As I was saying, I am really disturbed that the city was so quick to introduce this resolution that would require all persons except for city staff and workers to introduce this resolution that would require all persons except for yeah city staff workers to go through physical screening process by security personnel each time that they enter a city building, attend a city council meeting or city meeting or event. I am concerned about this resolution's long-term impacts on public participation, especially on the marginalized folks in this community, particularly undocumented residents who will be consequently dissuaded from participating in city events, meetings, and even entering the city building. The city seemingly introduced this resolution because every top 10 city, except the city of Bakersfield, has implemented physical security measures at city buildings. First off, what makes you think you're in the top 10 cities? What is your source? The only thing I can think of that the city of Bakersfield is top 10 of is police brutality. I implore you to use your authority and not pass this resolution. This resolution says there will be no fiscal impact, but there is already fiscal impact and no transparency. So Christian, city manager, I request that you respond and share one, how much the city has spent on staffing peace officers in the past four, now five, city council meetings, including the 3 p.m. sessions. Two, how much the city spent to rent all equipment deployed at this city council meeting and the last one on March 27th. Three, how much the city spent to repair the glass door and whether the city collected any bids for that. And lastly, share very specifically what funds were used for each of these expenditures. And please be more specific than just say, the general fund. Nothing, Christian. All right, wife cheater, ma'am pre, are you willing to ask these questions? They're printed right in front of you. Silence. I can't say I'm surprised. This won't be the end. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And just for clarification, we are the ninth largest city, so that's the 10 is referring to the ninth largest city in California. Go ahead. I am a resident in Bakersfield, and I condemn the use of more local tax dollars or unnecessary security measures. I urge the city council to vote against the passage of this resolution. That money could go to actually help our communities or underserved communities. Do not pass this resolution. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Yes, B, followed by Mana Kinares, followed by Dave Demahowski. Would you go ahead and call that speaker again, please? Yes. Let's, how do you spell it, um, Madam Clerk? Y-U-S-S. -S. Oh, okay, so Martin. So, Welcome, please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Martin. I'm a resident here in Bakersfield, and I'm urging you to instead address this matter, um, which is essentially giving more funding to police here in City Hall uh, to address the 186-day terrorist bombing campaign that the Israeli occupation forces have been escalating in Gaza with the full funding of billions in U.S. taxpayers' dollars. But again, instead, the city manager is introducing a resolution instead of the resolution that community members have been asking for over 84 days just to call for a discussion to talk about a ceasefire. Instead, the manager thinks it's more appropriate to introduce a resolution today, again, to increase and give even more funds of our tax dollars to cops here. 
This is the only response we've gotten from the city, apart from Manpreet barely raising her hand most of the time to condemn what's happening, but never responding to her Palestinian community members or any of the rest of us about how she can go about to use her voice and take actions to join the millions of Americans that are calling for an end to this genocide of Palestinians. Enough with your meaningless social media posts where you act like good people. Palestinians in our community are demanding you express solidarity and to show it with your actions. But Manpreet has decided to go back on her word and completely ignore hundreds of community members that have reached out directly to her about this. Manpreet, we have the receipts to prove you're all talk and a disgusting coward. And speaking of disgusting cowards, Mr. We Don't Have Time for poor Foreign Policy Stuff, Andre, you stupid evil snake. If you're supposed to be up there to serve the thousands of people living in Bakersfield, but Martin, instead you're Martin, silent. your time is up. Would you bring your comments to a close, you're please? You're silent while there's a genocide happening with your tax dollars. Shame on you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mana Kinares, followed by Dave Demahowski, followed by Scott Thayer. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Maria Quinones. Um, I just wanna say thank you to the city council. Thank you for showing us exactly who you are and what you stand for. Mayor Go, Andre Gonzalez, Patty Gray, Eric Arias, thank you for showing us what a deeply distorted, white supremacist, Islamophobic, Zionist version of Christianity looks like a leadership that upholds the evils of empire and self-promotion masked by Christianity. I say no in Jesus' name, no. These extra security measures unjustly target black, indigenous, Arab, um, and many other constituents of, constituents of color, the undocumented community. As a seminary graduate, I am sickened to my core by your witness and your behavior towards Muslim, Christian, Jewish, LGBTQ+, disabled constituents, and especially Palestinian constituents who have families undergoing genocide and famine. These are our constituents in Bakersfield. Maybe if they were Christian, you'd consider these constituents human and treat them with dignity. Maybe if they weren't brown. But you know, this doesn't include Palestinian Christians. This doesn't include other folks. The children of Gaza say, I hunger and thirst, and you tend to their wounds with vinegar. Bombs break the skins of newborns as Bakersfield hands 4.5 million to Israel and gives money over to increase security. Thus says the Lord, whatever you did not do for me, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. In Gaza, Jesus is being martyred again and again and again, 40,000 times. These security measures are not Please a, bring your a good comments witness. to a close. Thank you. I am appalled by this leadership. Next speaker, please. Dave Demahowski regarding item 7C1 followed by Scott Dyer, also on item 7C1. Yeah, uh, Welcome. Mayor and council members, if this is the appropriate time and procedure, we're requesting that item 7C1 be pulled from the consent calendar for separate consideration. This would be the time to speak on that item. It, I think you may be aware the Home Builders Association of Kern County has expressed concerns about the proposed elimination, virtual elimination of parking requirements for multifamily residential construction in a suburban setting. We understand the interest in uh, parking reductions in the urban core. Uh, our concern is really with market rate multifamily housing in a suburban setting where we think the proposed 0.25 spaces per dwelling unit is completely inadequate given current market conditions. 
So we're requesting simply that the council refer this back to staff for further discussion and hopefully come up with a, a solution that everybody can support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nomar. Next speaker, please. I think it's Mr. Thayer. Mr. Thayer. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, staff. My name is Scott Thayer. I'm Senior Vice President of Castle and Cook. You may wonder why I'm up here on this topic today. Well, as you well know, Castle and Cook's been a big part of the uh, Bakersfield fabric for a number of decades, and uh, we're concerned that the elimination or reduction in the parking standards uh, could be a recipe for failure if not thought out thoroughly. Um, Bakersfield is a bedroom community. Um, people use their vehicles uh, to get around. We're not San Francisco, New York, or, or another large uh, high-density community uh, where transportation is more abundant, it's widely used, parking structures are in place for office use in the daytime and residential use in the evening. We, meaning all of us, already know the issues are created when demand for parking exceeds supply. The Dignity Health Amphitheater is a good example. Here, there isn't enough parking to handle many of the amphitheater events. Patrons at those events try to park at the shops at Riverwalk, and when that fills up, spills into the adjacent neighborhoods. The merchants at the shopping center aren't real happy, and either are the residents. In this example, the hardship only happens a few times a year. Just think of this going on 365 days a year if the new parking ordinance is, is enacted and we didn't address the what if. Eliminating and or reducing residential parking can work, but it takes more than just passing an ordinance for it to be successful. There are details that need to be vetted and worked through, or worked through before a change like the one being proposed can work. It's my opinion we're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thayer. Next speaker, please. Rudy Patel, followed by Lance. Welcome, please introduce yourself, and would you lower the mic, please? My name is Ruthie, I'm here to speak on agenda item 7D1, um, but also addressing Councilman Smith's comments that he doesn't know what he's talking about with the California Labor Commission, a press release from the State of California Department of Industrial Relations. The Labor Commissioner's Office collected 1.3 million in wages and penalties resulting from a prevailing wage assessment against Bakersfield-based subcontractor Grant Construction employed by Sage Smith Equi or Sage Equities. The wages collected will compensate 27 workers for unpaid prevailing wages while working on a farm worker housing construction project Patel, in the city of Wasco in Kern Ms. County. Patel, this portion is reserved for- If he gets to respond, I do too, Karen. Then following item Ms. 71. Patel, go ahead with 71. The increased criminalization for no need other than you don't like when people come and hold you guys accountable for introducing ceasefire resolutions because the only escalation in violence has been by you all. And so there's no need to continue. In the last five years I've attended city council meetings, there's never been metal detectors, there's never been more cops. The only reason you're doing it is because people actually don't care if you guys don't like them and they're actually resisting so you want to criminalize them. And then on top of it all, my councilman, Bruce Freeman, in, still will continue oppression here locally when he actually supports this and most likely will support voting for the resolution. And there's what I need the community members behind me to understand is that these electeds don't really care about you. The only thing you're going to do, even if you vote them out of office, Munpreet sold her soul after leaving Jakar Movement as their development director, now working for a wonderful company as farm workers are unionizing with Wonderful, and they still won't let them unionize. So she sold her goddamn soul. So regardless of whether you elect people into office, they'll backstab you, they'll let you die, and for that reason, you guys want to criminalize us with metal detectors? We'll see you at your house. We'll murder you. Next speaker, please. Lance, followed by Kev, followed by Valeria. 
Ms. Patel, Ms. Patel, that was a threat, what you said at the end, and so the officers are going to escort you out and take care of that. We'll just wait until the doors close. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name's Lance Mack and I'm here to, tonight to talk about um, these proposed security protocols. I read through your comprehensive list within the proposal itself of all the security measures you've already implemented over the past few months and it makes me feel like haven't you already really covered everything you really need to to protect this building? It kind of also struck me as odd that you really can't name any of the spending that you'll have to do in the future to continue to have these security checkpoints, which makes me think it's gonna cost a lot more than any of the taxpayers would be willing to spend. And um, why would we want to support a resolution that's gonna have all these like hidden secret costs? Like, why can't you be transparent about it? That's really shady and not cool. Um, also, every city council meeting that I've ever been to um, that have minimal police presence have been very peaceful and nonviolent, but the more police that you bring into this building, the more chaos you invite into this space. The current system that you've had has worked pretty well, it's pretty safe, and it doesn't waste anyone's time and it doesn't waste anyone's money. So the only thing that I have seen that has changed in these last few meetings is that you don't like the criticism that you're getting from the community and you want to find ways to get them to not come back. And it's specifically targeting people of color, it's specifically targeting LGBT people, like, and this violence and is coming from the police. It's not coming from your constituents. You have not been threatened. Prop, like, I know that something just happened now, but I'm saying up to, up till the police presence being increased, things were very peaceful. And you guys come in through separate chambers, you leave through separate chambers, you don't have to come in through the metal detectors or leave through the metal detectors. This is all being imposed on the public. And so it's not fair that you're the ones that get to vote on this. We should have a say in this. And it's just, I don't know, I just feel like it's wrong and it keeps a lot of people out of this room. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Lance. Next speaker, please, Madam Clerk. Kev, followed by Valeria followed by Gabby. Welcome, please introduce okay. yourself. Who was the April Foolsters that came up with this resolution? Because y'all are really getting me with this one. No one? This is actually serious? Because this resolution claims that it is of paramount concern for public safety. But I feel like if you were really concerned about public safety, you would spend a little bit more time addressing our very own police force, one of the most dangerous in the nation. The same police force that's within the top 11th percentile for being unlikely to hold themselves accountable, one of the ones in the top 12th percentile for being the most deadly, using deadly force on unarmed civilians, and we still let them in here? We let murderers in here? Because whatever this is, it's disgusting. How is it that in a few weeks you can put together such a resolution, but you can't even address a ceasefire resolution that was handed to you months ago? Like, really, it's been expressed that your condemning of a genocide would show that you are on a side of humanity, that you wouldn't stand on a side that infringes on the rights and freedoms of other humans, or at the very least, that you would stand with your community and support and reassure them. But that is not true for you, because here I am now, I'm thirsty, I haven't had water this whole meeting, because I can't have a single water bottle in here? What kind of threat of security is a water bottle? A water bottle. Exactly. And like I said, you have police in here. If you all want to look over, he has a firearm. Some of these have batons. They have tasers. They have weapons. Whereas we can't have a water bottle? I can't bring a spoon in here? What kind of bullshit I'm gonna is that? stop you right there just because for a minute. Whatever, Sir, uh, just stop for one minute. Can... I am on my last No, statement. I'm going to let you finish. I'm addressing this gentleman right here. You are because being disruptive. Your speech is being disruptive, 
and I am directing the officer to escort you out because you've already had a warning. We want to hear this gentleman. Kev, no. go ahead and con uh, let's just let him leave, and then and we're going to let you continue. And you stick your dogs to whoever. I'm not, I'm not bothered by this man applying just some sentiments of his own to my speech. I could speak through it. I can handle that. But whatever. As I'm running out of time, I just want to say that I am a resident of Bakersfield, and I condemn the use of our local tax dollars on this mystery, unnecessary security measure, and I urge the city council to vote against the passage of this resolution. Free Palestine within our lifetime. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Valeria, followed by Gabby. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Valeria. I am here to oppose the City Council's desire to strengthen the physical security procedures to access city buildings. Um, we do not need our city budget going to more equipment in the lobby and policing. After today, it's quite clear that our unhoused population needs resources, the same unhoused population that Andre keeps locked out of the David Nelson Pocket Park bathrooms. Um, I don't know why you think it's necessary, given that I have attended, I believe, the last six City Council uh, 515 meetings in a row now. Uh, so have many of us here. We're here. We're some of the only people in Bakersfield who actually attend these meetings consistently. We're constantly filling up the seats every time. So it should matter to you what we think and feel because, you know, you're our representatives. But you've done nothing to represent any of us. If you truly cared about all of your constituents, you'd be reducing the amount of police in here and in general. They're absolutely useless to our public. They're just here for you, Karen, to use as your little henchman. I've spoken to so many loved ones that have told me about how they've been in situations of abuse, situations of violence, car addict accidents, and the police have shown up several hours, sometimes days later. Sometimes they don't give you anything but a follow-up phone call the next week. But after your play at the Ovation Theater, I'm so glad that there were at least six police able to clear their schedule to bring two of their city vehicles just to act as your valet and take your car. I'm sure you had more of them huddled around you when you scurried out the back. There have been absolutely zero instances of people bringing weapons or dangerous prohibited items of any kind. But yeah, thank God you guys put multiple signs outside to specify that we can't bring perfume, forks, or P38 can openers. Free Palestine. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Gabby. Good Welcome. Evening. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gabby. I've been here the past five meetings. I would really like it if I could have your attention, Andre. You are my city council member. I've been here. Any of you that want to give me your attention, your eye contact, your listening, I would appreciate it. Like my, my friend said before, I'm a constituent of this place in the earth. Y'all are elected to, to, to do a job and listen to me for two minutes. So I don't think one time for the past five sessions I've been here that all of you have collectively looked at me at the same time. But yet you respond to people when they talk about trees and stoplights. Um, but you won't respond to any of us who have friends, family members who are in Palestine and have lost their whole family name, lost family members. Just place yourself there. Have a conversation with us. Respond to us. You know, you want to call us these names. You want to in invite additional cops to come in here. For what? To protect you guys from, from people coming to talk to you? We might be one of the 10 biggest, like you might have corrected somebody earlier, but we're not one of the 10 best. And if you want to be like one of the 10 best cities that has fancy metal detectors every time you have to go to a meeting so that the constituents of the city can feel safe, how about look at us? Make us feel like you are listening to us, city manager. Respond Gabby, to our very well-pointed questions. Gabby, your questions. time is up. Would you bring I know your comments my time to is a up, close, But please? I've been here every time, and you guys don't listen to us. People watch these videos on YouTube. People need to understand that you guys don't even look at us. You look at your Gabby, phones. You, the, te the cops are texting each other, making your awkward Your time plans. is up. Thank you. Free Palestine. Thank you. And we have now come to the end of this session. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Consent calendar items 7A through 7I for approval. 
A staff memorandum was received transmitting correspondence and staff comments regarding item 7C1. A staff memorandum was also received for item 7D1 transmitting an amended Exhibit A. A staff memorandum was additionally received for item 7E4 requesting the item be removed from the agenda tonight. Vice Mayor. Does any member of the council wish to recuse themselves from any item? Seeing none, we have one request from council member Freeman to remove item 7C for separate consideration. With that, I will move to uh, approve the consent calendar. You have a motion, please catch your votes. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. And now, item 7C, Councilmember Freeman. The reason I ask that this be removed is um, we've worked for three months on revising our zoning codes, at which was very complicated, had quite a few committee meetings, and good participation from council members and the public, and I think we achieved, of those hundreds and hundreds of changes, we have like 99% of them we all agree to. The total support, I think, from community and from the council on 99%, and we're down to like one little item that has, um, has kind of flummoxed us. Uh, we, we've heard quite a few speakers over the weeks express extreme concerns about the no parking for future multi-plan projects, or in this case was revised to be like one-fourth of the, you know, one for each four units. Um, and the reason I don't think that particular, it was, a try, it was an attempt to compromise, but I don't think it quite works is there are projects that don't need parking. And if we had a typical 200-unit apartment, we'd make that developer build 50 parking spaces if his tenants didn't have cars and didn't need them at all. So they'd get penalized, and then an apartment that was a normal apartment that would really require at least 200 units, uh, that developer, if they were you know, not a smart or bad developer, and there are bad developers, I've been doing it 33 years, and they're just like any other profession, there are some bad eggs, uh, well, that person would be 150 units short of what was needed. Um, and I agree there aren't, we, this, this it wouldn't happen all the time. It would be, as I've seen, a, at some point, there'll be someone who tries to get a little greedier, save some costs, and does something that they shouldn't, and the neighborhoods would be flooded as they all over in Southern California when they didn't used to require parking. That's why I have parked in it. And the neighbors are disastrous all over Southern California. People drive all night long looking for a farming place because they live in an apartment on that street that has no parking. So uh, I think we can probably solve this um, with a little creative thinking and a little more discussion, which I would just like the council work a little harder to find a resolution to this one item, uh, one possible solution, and not the only one, but one that I, you know, we, we should at least look at is we have a provision that allows any developer to uh, apply to the planning director and ask for a waiver of all parking standards if they have, you know, if they're building a project that really doesn't need parking. And I, I would suggest as one of the potential solutions that we revise the language to make it perfectly clear. If you have a project that really will not need parking, it may be a senior's project that People don't have cars. It could be an affordable housing. It could be a lot of different things. But, you know, the, the targeted tenant really wouldn't need a car, so wouldn't need parking. Well, then I'd like the criteria set up so planning director is just like pretty automatic. That project's going to get approved with no parking. Um, but then if, if they don't present a reasonable argument for that waiver, then we just revert to what have all been pretty severely reduced parking standards that we already have. And I'm not saying that's the only solution. Someone else may have a better idea than I have. I'd like to see us put our little 
creative thinking caps on and work a little harder on that so what i'd like to do is i would i would i'm going to make a motion that we table or defer this one item for a few meetings um, and then we ask staff to help us with some language that would make it and with other ideas that I didn't think of, including other ideas council members may have that may be creative on how to how do we resolve this um, so that all these voices feel like they got heard. I mean, I, I don't get I haven't ever heard anybody in favor of this. I've heard the people who are worried about it because they're worried about that bad developer. Not most of them, but that one. And I think we need to recognize it's a, it's a legitimate concern. And I want them to feel in the end that you know their voice was heard. Um, and I really would like us to pass, this is an important thing, our zoning. I'd like to have a 7-0 vote up here. That we could all come together and say, as a council, we back all of this. So that's the reason I would like to defer this for a few more meetings uh, and have us all work on some language that, that's acceptable to all of us. Um, so that is my, uh, that's my motion. Thank you. Councilmember Gray. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to support what Councilmember Freeman is saying and also um, support our, our builders and developers here in Bakersfield. I have spoken in the last two meetings that I feel like that this is something that we need to look harder at and take our time with, as our council member has suggested tonight, made a motion, because this is gonna affect our city for decades to come, possibly. Not, this is a once and done deal. And I just think we're moving along a little quickly and haven't taken everything into consideration that we need to take into consideration. And we need to listen to some of these other stakeholders, those especially have come tonight to speak to us in this regard and make a, a very well-educated decision. And I agree with you, Council Member Freeman, that it, it's so much better when we can come into a 7-0 agreement from this dais than being so splintered, especially on something like this that's so vital and very, very important. So I appreciate the motion. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Boyle, I, I think at your initial presentation, you mentioned that the state was already going in the direction of, of no parking standards. If you're on a transit corridor, uh, if, 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 different things. We already have numerous places. I, I think the argument could be made with uh, get on demand that everything's a transit corridor and, and state may apply to that. So, and you also mentioned quite a few cities have already went to no parking standards. Would you kind of restate some of that? Mr. Boy. Mayor, council members. There are several laws that are on the books that speak to um, a waiver of parking standards for certain development. Um, as noted, within a half mile of a transit corridor, no parking standards are, parking standards cannot be applied by a particular city. Um, there is a definition of a, of a high, tra high transit corridor, um, but, and the city doesn't have a lot of those right now, but um, that is a policy. There, there also is uh, requirements for no parking to be employed in certain instances, such as with a, a church, development that's associated with a church would not be required to um, apply parking standards. Um, some additional laws that are out there right now um, that um, either are adopted or are under consideration, but, um, and as noted, there are several of our top 10 cities that have also waived parking standards. Thank you. I, I you know, we discussed this in committee. We, we, we don't agree. <laughs> and I, I believe that getting rid of parking standards at this time will help affordable housing. We always say affordable housing is a key. And I think that the suburban model uh, wasteland, there will still be parking Developers will provide parking. Scott Thayer will provide parking. I'm sure he will. Uh, 
So I, I'm in favor of the motion as stated. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm in favor of the motion in the report. So you're making there, a new motion. There is no motion. In, okay, I got you. Would you like to make a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve item C1 as stated Thank in you, the staff Council, report. Thank you, Council Member Kaur. Oh, press wrong one. Thank you. Um, a few questions also just uh, for the sake of clarifying uh, for folks and the general public. Um, Chris, could you tell us, or could you paint a picture of a, uh, for us um, as cities who have benefited from reducing parking requirements? Could you share some examples um, and, and just paint a better picture of that, uh, share some of the cost benefits that we've seen and also how um, you see this being implemented in some of our suburbs here in Bakersfield? Thank you, Council Member. Parking costs money. Um, and with that, um, the, the requirements for parking add costs to the overall development of any project. Um, consequently, um, those costs are also absorbed by the individuals who are housed in those projects. Um, with a push for more affordable housing by the state and the housing crisis, Many cities have, in, have employed opportunities for reduced or no parking standards and relied upon the market conditions to drive um, how parking is provided. I, I don't know of any situations in the major cities that we've looked at, um, Sacramento, San Jose, San Diego, um, all don't have parking standards um, and all are embracing a, additional densities of, in their downtown core and mixed use developments um, reaching out into their suburbs, um, largely because um, there's an understanding there that the market, can, the market drives the conditions of how much parking is provided. And if one doesn't provide sufficient parking, then consequently uh, that project is in danger of, of you know, not being attractive to potential renters or buyers. And so consequently it really is a, parking is, a, is driven by the market itself. Um, that said, um, even here in Bakersfield, we've had opportunities to embrace higher, higher density development in our downtown core, at least in three instances where, where developers came and desired to build uh, platform type development that um, had three, four, five, six, even six floors of housing associated with it. But a number one cost consideration there was the, the cost to provide parking at the city standards um, for those for that higher density development. So consequently, there's an opportunity there. We, we haven't seen any negative impacts that come to us from cities that are, that are comparable to us in terms of in a top 10 cities. And um, I, understand, I understand the committee's rationales as it relates to um, reducing parking standards um, for the city of Bakersfield. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Um, another question I have just because we've heard uh, from our friends in the developer community, would this prevent them from developing as they do today? Would this new policy prevent them from incorporating as many parking spots? Um, or are we just to clarify, we are placing the trust with our developers to kind of determine how many parking spots are then placed. If you could also share that for um, the benefit of the public. Thank you, council member. Um, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a mandate to not provide parking. Um, the, mandate, um, the mandate isn't there. There are no minimum or m maximum parking stall standards that would be employed. So the market can still 
build uh, apartment complexes in a similar form as they're being built right now. And there may be rationales where um, less parking, less parking, but there are, there's a, only a minimum threshold of 0.25 units, uh, stalls per each unit in apartments that exceed 20 dwelling units. The, there's a reliance on the market to determine how many parking stalls a developer provides. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna emphasize what you've just said, the reliance on the market. So as other cities have followed in the trend of reducing parking requirements, um, there's plenty of data available and studies available and examples and precedent studies available um, and you can reference American Planning Association's website. They've got plenty of examples as well. Um, we're really placing the trust with business owners and developers to guide their own projects rather than government telling you how many parking spots that you need. You've been you're, you are developing, you're a business owner, you know best what your customer is going to need and what is affordable to you. Um, and so in my eyes, reducing a parking requirement achieves that as well. Not only that, but the American Planning Associ Association talks quite uh, extensively about how parking requirements, reducing parking requirements, promote small business development and growth. It promotes housing development, as Councilmember Smith has indicated. And it's not only big cities and top 10 cities who are doing this. Um, rural cities and communities are also reducing their parking requirements because they realize how small but significant of a difference um, reducing a parking requirement can make. More than 130 cities with populations under 100,000, rural and urban, have reduced their parking requirements, reduced the barriers to develop more affordable housing, um, to develop the missing middle housing that's very much necessary, and kind of follows in the cycle um, of houselessness and, and how that contributes um, to a very much urgent housing crisis that we're experiencing kind of everywhere. Uh, so I at least wanted to highlight that as we have this conversation, as we're hearing from different stakeholders, um, to share that perspective and, and share very real um, and important city planning and urban planning, not only trend, um, but movement that has is happening. And I think our city would benefit greatly, uh, especially being in uh, Ward 7, where I have inherited a, a district that I call the suburb of this, the urban core. And um, there are very, very large commercial parking lots that sit empty for most of the year. And especially in our summer months, which seem like they are longer, uh, here uh, than elsewhere, but what that also does is it com contributes to our heat island effect that we're feeling in the city, and so those communities feel hotter. So it's not just where you're parking, but it's also the material and how that's contributing to the environment around it. And I know we've all maybe visited cities where we admire um, mixed use developments, five over ones. We have retail on the first floor, we have housing on top, it's walkable, there's uh, there's tree canopies. We're visiting these cities already when we vacation or when we're, um, we're out of Bakersfield. So this is one encouraging step to see that within our own city as well. So I uh, wanted to make sure that I added that city planning perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Corvus, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just some comments real quick. I mean, I, I understand and appreciate the comments from the developer community. Um, you know, I understand the the concern. It's just really hard for me to imagine that a developer will come in without any parking, knowing that, as it was stated, we are, Bakersfield is a bedroom community or it is a commuter community. And so uh, it seems to me that a smart business decision would be to provide parking for those tenants uh, that will need it. Um, and I think where this really uh, becomes an issue is with affordable housing. As Councilmember Smith pointed out, um, there are many affordable housing projects that simply do not require uh, or do, do not need uh, parking at all. I'll give you two examples. Sixth Street Apartments in Ward 2 just opened recently. 26 units 
were occupied in the first phase. The number of parking stalls that were actually utilized out of 26 units, two. Two. And one was utilized from the maintenance worker. One resident out of 26 units needed parking. 1622 Union Avenue, 86 units, another project in Ward 2, 86 units of affordable housing. The number of units that actually require parking, number of parking spots, nine. Nine, far less than that uh, threshold that we've established. So I think this is really, um, you know, our, our parking mandates have really impacted our ability to build affordable housing. And frankly, we need to build affordable housing throughout the city, not just concentrated in central Bakersfield, uh, where we've uh, often hosted the, the development of the majority of affordable housing over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, so I, I'm going to support the motion to move adoption of this policy tonight. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Arias, change your mind. Okay, so we have, I don't see any other requests from the council to speak. You have, a, you have the motion that Council Member Smith made. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Council Members Weir, Freeman and Gray voting no. Thank you. And now next item, please. Hearings item 9A, public hearing to consider first reading of an ordinance for zone change number 24-0055 on approximately 998 acres. Our next item, public hearings uh, will for our next item, public hearings, each side will be allowed 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes for all speakers per side. So it's important that you identify yourself, make your statement succinctly so others may speak. We'll hear statements from those first who are opposed to the staff's recommendation. Then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of the staff's recommendation. If there's testimony on both sides, each side will be allowed a 15 a five minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the TV screens behind me which indicates 15 minutes. Please step to the microphone, identify yourself. After 14 minutes, a yellow light will come on and at the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash indicating your time is up. Quickly end your statement. You may ask questions during your statement, but they won't be addressed until the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, give them to the clerk. She'll provide copies to the council. Please be courteous to others who wish to speak. Now, staff, Mr. Clegg. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. Our, our Development <coughs> Services Director, Chris Boyle, has a brief introduction to this item. Mr. Boyle. Thank you, Madam Mayor, council members. Uh, first, I wanna thank you for all your hard work as it relates to zoning. I promised to bring you rezone specific to that zoning ordinance uh, on, in short order, and this uh, essentially is uh, delivering on that promise. The rezonings are necessary to provide the required inventory of housing sites appropriately zoned to comply with our regional housing needs assessment for the six cycle housing element that we're actively engaged in. A little bit on the process. Uh, it has been a long process. This should not come as a surprise. Um, our, the, the actual formulations for our arena were assembled or the regional housing need allocation were assembled by or released by um, current council of governments in 2022. And um, uh, those were ultimately approved by approved by HCD or the Housing and Community Development Department. Um, briefly, these are our numbers that we, that we are tasked with creating, uh, 37,461 units. And as you can see in the yellow or the orange across the bar, I highlight that only so we can see that those units are also broken down into income levels for very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income categories. 
So when we look at uh, that uh, from a broad perspective, the city's asked to prepare or provide 18,211 low and very low units and 19,250 moderate and above moderate, oftentimes called market rate units. Our mix of housing is almost 50-50, with 49% being affordable and 51% being um, market rate units. Uh, the city's tasked with providing 65% of the county's overall arena. Now let's transition into this rezone because the two go hand in hand. I've added the, the colored bars at the top of the, of the table to relate the zone districts that satisfy those various income designations. So for very low income, your mixed use two, your R5 and R6. For low and very low income, for low income, MX1 and R4 and so on and so forth um, to from moderate R2, R3, and RS and R1 for um, above moderate income categories. And that's what the city is working towards providing um, those units based on um, income, income categories. Now, we're fortunate to have some carryover sites from our fifth cycle, and they're shown on this map in blue um, and uh, we, our proposed rezones that you're taking action tonight are here um, provided in a very large map. I, I understand uh, that maybe not be at the perfect scale, but it gives it gives it a dissemination of how those those parcels are distributed throughout the community. And um, how did we come about uh, assembling that? Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of not um, telling someone what their zoning designation is. We started our outreach back in January um, to parcels that had been identified as being suitable for these various zoning designations. So in total, we've had four outreaches to those, those individual parcels and, uh, and parcel owners, including the final um, public hearing notice. And within that, we provided an FAQ, we provided descriptions of the uh, various zone districts that they might be employed with. We also actually provided a consent for rezone um, such that we could gauge the relative support that was coming back from the community from, from this effort. In the end, we removed a total of 35 parcels from consideration because property owners did not desire uh, the zones that were proposed. And that totaled about 145.57 acres and in turn, uh, we lost approximately 3,000 uh, units uh, in various um, income categories. Th that said, you can expect a second a rezoning effort to come across your dais in the not too distant future. We'll be sending out our second round of letters in the next couple of weeks with an anticipation of coming to the dais in June. When you look at the total number of units broken down by those particular zones, you can see that this rezone provides for almost 18,000 units towards that 37,561 units. And I was also note, it's not counting units that were already carried over and included, it's not including those number of units that are generated by pre-existing conditions. So we feel that we're, we're getting very close to meeting those RENA requirements. Um, so cumulatively, our vacant sites um, are as such. I would note too that there's a, an, another effort that's running side by side with this in uh, that you have also seen pre-zonings and general plan amendments come across the board for subsequent proposed annexations that would also help fill the city's needs. With that said, staff from the Planning Commission would recommend first reading of the ordinance. Thank you. At this time, item 9A is open. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Please come to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Welcome. 
Hello again. Um, Sandra Placencia, current policy advocate with Leadership Council. Um, so thank you, Mr. Boyle, for actually communicating with us this morning and sending us the PowerPoint um, beforehand, and we appreciate it. Um, and we just wanted to reiterate that as the city engages in the rezone, uh, we remind the city to comply with a housing element law to conduct a thorough analysis of sites and ensure the equitable distribution of sites is in compliance with affirmatively furthering fair housing. If the rezoning is meant to fulfill um, is meant to fulfill the housing element arena, please continue to engage with residents and community at large. We also recommend hosting workshops on the un upcoming draft um, that should be released later this month to gather community input. Lastly, we want to uplift community priority programs and use this time to uplift the need to include um, programs into the next housing element draft. We ask for inclusionary zoning, right to counsel, rental assistance, rehabilitation and repair, rent stabilization and just cause and a maximum indoor air temperature standard. We reiterate that these programs will help the city reach compliance with state law, and we urge the city to include them in the second housing element draft. And I do want to reiterate, um, the folks that are going to speak behind, um, after me are here speaking on behalf of programs because the city has not done a great job in including them and talking to community members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Placencia. Who, would, who else would like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Please come to the mic. Hi, uh, my name is Dave yourself. Thomas. How's everybody doing? I'll be nicer than most people here. My name is Dave Thomas. I represent 341 homeowners in the community of Tuskegee. I stand opposed to zoning revision 24055. This revision is too broad in, in scope and vague in purpose. Instead of actually planning our community so that it is livable, as a Blue Zone initiative does, it will rubber stamp not only uncontrolled growth, but it will allow revisions that will actually impede sustainable growth. I have been in construction for 45 years and worked with Habitat for Humanity for years to build low-income affordable housing. Even Denny Wallace, right there, would say this is nuts. This revision is just an end run to get approval for revisions such as 22-0127, uh, which would build apartments in a food, job, transportation, and school desert. It benefits no one. Building an expansive soil on a hillside is a disaster waiting to happen. The best way to fix a disaster is never let it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Can you, Mr. Can Thomas? Leave this to the you can give it uh, to the, just lay it right there. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Yes, Mark McGargy, also resident of Tuscany. There are two Bakersfields. There is a Bakersfield that's in the Central Valley of California. There is a second Bakersfield that is a very narrow strip of the Sierra Nevada foothills. Dave and I live in that area. There are proposals now coming before the planning and board to put up the similar multi-story, high-density residential in the backyard of million-dollar houses. People who paid for views of the Kern River and the Sierra Nevada. I mean million-dollar lots. And to bring this part of the urban core of Bakersfield, in which several of these in this proposal are almost on top of Rio Bravo, Hidden Lakes, Tuscany, Cattle King. That is the most desirable, attractive part. You need to separately, individually consider zone changes, general plan amendments, and all of us would support not having these type of R3 structures in what is your most desirable area in your community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGarty. Who else would like to speak in opposition? Welcome, please introduce Hi, yourself. Hi, my name is Cheryl Jacopetti Thomas, and I urge you to not approve this blanket rezoning of uh, ZR24055. In building a large apartment complex out in the Hill area, you are disregarding the Blue Zone initiative of building livable multifamily dwellings close to shopping, schools, parks, work, workplaces, and public transportation. Let's just say you were to zone 
change the zoning of the area between Tuscany Hills Lane and the future Allegheny Court to multifamily dwelling. There's no grocery store within seven miles. There's no public transportation in the area. The roadway is a two-lane road with no plan to improve it, and it cannot handle over 650 more cars going both ways twice a day. Along with it being a very dangerous exit from the future Allegheny Court to enter Alfred Harold Highway. There are no sidewalks for the children to walk on to the nearest park, which is 3.7 miles away. The schools are already impacted, and if you are a new high schooler to the area, you will be bused to Centennial. The water issue is as slim as it is. Tuscany's water is pumped from the river to a large holding tank, and in 2022, Lake Isabella was down to 6%. If it had dropped another fraction of a percent, it could not have exited the outlet, and we in Tuscany would have been cut off of our water supply. That's another reason not to rezone this area and to make a, a single family dwelling of homes. The electrical infrastructure is inadequate in this area and we have lost power twice in the last two months for more than 20 hours just from fallen poles. Um, we have endangered species in the area and these need to be protected. The hillside topography is greater than 30% slope and any cutting and excavation could greatly change the stability of the upper land lots. Any zone change in this hillside area first needs to have a new EIR and a CEQA approval and extensive valley fever soil testing and a current water will serve letter. Please do not approve this blanket rezoning. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Anyone else like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Welcome, please introduce yourself. Yes, hello, my name is Wendell Wesley Jr., uh, city management, city staff. Um, you know, one thing I noticed, this very good presentation, by the way, is that um, this looks like it's all done on people's gross income. And the measure that is used currently right now with the highs and the lows um, of the median price incomes, and we're gauging homes that are way out there on Norris Road that should not be in the equation. Okay, because they're not a true represent, representation of Bakersfield. So we do need inclusionary zonings. We see that a lot of these homes right now are in areas east of the 99. It's the most heavily polluted areas, you know, and we need um, to do more with our environment before we start putting concentrated levels of people in those areas, okay? So we need to move more towards a human center um, society when it comes to regard to our housing as well. I would like to see you guys come to the table with us and address where these homes are and the cost of them because everything is connected and everything really does make a difference. And for families and seniors specifically, they can't be living in a lot of these areas where there's higher risk of pollution, valley fever, and other issues like that, where they're in communities where there's already too many liquor stores, too many smoke shops, okay? That's not where we want our children living. So we need to really, you know, maybe just get rid of some of these liquor stores and smoke shops, you know? Put in a Costco, a Walmart, things that families need, because this is not a good representation of Bakersfield. So please come to the table with us. We do need these homes, and we want to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. Anyone else who'd like to speak in opposition? Welcome. Hi. Please introduce My yourself. My name is Veronica. Um, I'm here to corroborate with what the first speaker, Ms. Placencia, said, uh, reminding you guys that keeping people house is cheaper than housing on house folks. And um, even our police department, well, our peace officers, because it's the sheriff's department, who handles evictions and things like that, would also be less impacted if there was programs in place to keep people housed. Thanks. Thank you, Veronica. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak in opposition? Welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Timothy Sheehan, and uh, I just was going to fill in a little bit about, uh, um, I've, I've worked in Bakersfield for, I moved here in 2000. Uh, no, 90, 97, and uh, I, I was homeless for, for eight years um, here. Um, I've gotten off the streets. I, um, I worked with you, in fact, at, at Garden Pathways with Kim Alvarez and helping with the community and doing this. 
Um, I got back on my feet, got my kids back, um, went on Section 8 and got in this apartment. Um, and I, this, this, the, this Clemmer and Company was the name of the, the property management who just, they, they, my first time running into them, they came and they said, I need to inspect my place. And, and I've never had an inspection in 15 years. I've had Section 8. They've never, nobody has ever come and done an inspection. Um, I've always done it myself or Section 8's done it. Um, uh, they, they cut my locks. They shut the water off to the property. Um, they stuck stickers to my, my, my car saying happy towing because they were, because they were just, I mean, it was, I mean, it's just, it, it affected me. I mean, and it, like I said, and I've since, I've since lost my section I mean, and, and just because of the, um, because I wouldn't, because I didn't let them in my house or I didn't allow them to cut my locks to get into my house. Um, I ultimately ended up losing my, losing my, I'm back out on the streets again and, and couldn't find any help. I mean, I've, and I've, like I said, I've worked and pay taxes. <laughs> I vote <laughs> and, and I couldn't get any help here in Kern County from nobody. And ultimately I ended up, you know, thank God, by the grace of God, I had somebody that could, could put me up in their garage and, and otherwise I'd be right back out on the street. Um, um, I just, I don't want it to be because it still hurts. You know, um, it shouldn't happen to anybody. They have to lose their place and be just, you know, thank God. I mean, I don't. My kids weren't with me at the time, but, but, but I mean, I'm, I'm basically on the streets again. You know, and and it wasn't no fault of my own because they wanted to. You know, but I just, you know, please help with the funding, for, you know, for right to counsel for people like me, for the next person that doesn't, you know, that might not have, you know, so this kind of thing does not happen to them. This is just not fair. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, is somebody on staff able just to get his contact information so we can follow up? Uh, Mr. Sheehan, if you go back there, uh, our assistants, oh, Mr. Johnson will just get some contact information. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation on this item? Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank Please you. Thank yourself. you. Um, my name is Norma Diaz, and I don't know a lot about the laws and zoning and all that, but I'm beginning to learn a little bit, and I concur with everything they're opposing. And um, I like that, you know, we could talk about this and have an opportunity to bring it before um, the whole council. And, um, and I feel really bad for that gentleman. So thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll have somebody follow up. Uh, is there anybody else who'd like to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Seeing none, is there anyone who would like to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Please come forward. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hello, um, as you know, I'm uh, Roman Matera. Um, is it all right if I address the chamber with a question? I just want to ask if I'm the only uh, one. Oh. Oh. You can go ahead and talk to the council. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask whether or not I was the only one speaking in uh, support of this resolution. Um, just because I want to know how much time, but um, I don't see. Just anybody. go ahead and okay. Speak. Well, I'm looking at this resolution, and as you know, I've gone to a lot of committee meetings, and I've argued, and I've argued for these exact points. Actually, I've argued for mixed use in order to better meet people's needs. And um, though it is intimidating to stand alone when so many people have uh, spoken in opposition. I guess I can take this time to talk about why it's so important and talk about how I feel it benefits the different groups in this country. So I'll speak to myself first. I am educated. I have two associate's degrees. One of them is in mathematics. This isn't some kind of basket weaving degree or you know anything like that. And I haven't been able to find a job and I've been challenged in terms of my housing. One of the biggest ways that I've been challenged is because I don't have a car and Though I don't have that kind of uh, clinical anxiety that often associates some people who try to learn how to drive, I do still get pretty anxious behind the wheel whenever I hear about all those statistics about how dangerous it can be. Mixed-use zoning 
if there was more opportunity available to residents and to businesses to operate near their workers and their consumers would be a massive, massive win for the lower class and for anybody who is like me, who is poor and wants to find a job and who wants to find housing and are prepared to work hard for it. But it's not just a win for us, it's also a win for local businesses. Because when a local business is operating um, let's take, for instance, the, um, the, the one I talk about all the time, the um, plaza that has the Choose Fitness. It's on um, Stockdale and uh, California, I believe. In order for this plaza to find its workers, its workers have to come from outside of the plaza. Um, oftentimes this is easy because maybe a lot of them are just maybe five, ten minutes away, but... Very, very often, and I think if you look at a lot of the statistics, you will see a phenomenon called the rise of supercommuters. These are people who have to commute 20, 30, sometimes even an hour to get to their jobs. To say nothing of the horrible effects that this is in terms of climate change, this is just inefficient. And it hurts businesses to be able to perform in this environment. To support this mixed-use zoning is therefore not only a win for businesses who will have closer access to the workers and also to their consumers because, I mean, hey, if you lived inside of the plaza right next to the Choose Fitness in that grocery store, you're probably going to go there more often. Just walk like a minute to get there. But it's also a win for the middle class. And as it benefits business owners, it's also a win for the upper class who you know, tend to be invested in the stock market and are interested in businesses posting a profit after profit. So I'd also like to talk about one other group who I think will benefit from this as well. And it is, in fact, homeowners. You've heard from a lot of homeowners voice their um, concerns about this. I heard some comments about liquor stores and, uh, you know, various uh, unsavory businesses such as that. But I think the thing that spawns that is not really the mixed-use zoning. In fact, it's, you know, in my time over here, I just took the bus here. I saw, like, a couple of liquor stores and a couple of smoke shops. They were not in mixed-use neighborhoods. They were in poor, single-story, very, very spread-out neighborhoods, the same way we've been zoning for such a long time. So I don't think that this causes that. I think the true cause of this is the poverty that these that this current zoning policy that, um, you know, the way that we've been doing things creates. So when I saw this, um, apologies, it's uh, hard to flip. When I saw this in 9A as a resident of Bakersfield who's lived here for 20 years, legitimately speaking, my heart soared with pride. I know that sounds romantic, but... You know, I've got some friends in Texas, and, you know, sometimes we, you know what I mean? Like, it can be a bit of a rivalry, California and Texas, and, you know, every time they talk about housing, I have to give them the win, you know? Because uh, they kind of, I feel like they do that a lot better here. But I look at this proposal, and in my view, if we get the housing issue correct, if we get efficient land usage correct, I think that California will be the best place to live in the world. I say that with no hesitation. If you pass this policy, uh, if you, sorry, if you pursue this zoning the way that it's laid out, I believe that you will save, over the course of time, thousands of lives. You will give jobs to many, many people. You'll protect the prosperity of business owners who are looking for this kind of opportunity. And to be romantic for a second, you will restore the dignity of citizens who have often felt so alienated in this system. So I'm very happy with these zoning call or these um I'm very happy to see this on the agenda. It makes me proud about where the city is going. Thank you, Mr. Matera. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support of staff's recommendation? This is in support. I fully support Welcome. staff's effort to increase the density of the 100 square miles of the main urban area to better utilize vacant lots, areas where there are transportation and schools and grocery stores. I fully support that and applaud them for getting so many people to cooperate with that. Our only thing 
is about the extreme edges of Bakersfield and attempting to do without any of those services at the very extreme edges. Mr. Bagardi, for the record, would you just state your yeah. name, please? Mark Bagardi, uh, environmental consultant in Bakersfield. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none, is there anyone who would like to provide rebuttal in opposition to staff's recommendation? Seeing none, is there anyone who would like to provide rebuttal in support of staff's recommendation? Rebuttal. In Yes. yes. Hello, Roman Matera. I, I know. Um, I'll try to make it quick. You already heard one of my rebuttal points about the smoke shops and um, liquor stores. Um, I just want to reiterate that. Um, I also wanted to address some of these concerns about the, um, the zoning on the edge of the um, city. Um, I don't really think that the that the zoning as proposed would necessarily um, lead to a lot of these concerns that we're seeing people say. Um, it seems to me that if you zone for you know like a certain type of uh, property to be built there, and then you know like there's a um, there's some kind of like major problem like maybe it's on a landslide or like like you know it's not structurally stable. I don't really know why the developer would build it anyway. I mean, if it wasn't, I mean, like, why, why would they do that? It, it doesn't seem like a likely thing to me. And I really do want to say that if you should decide to be against this or you want to table this or anything like that, um, I just would emphasize to the highest degree that you act with all possible haste on this issue. There's so many people right now in the, like, we are in the midst of a housing crisis that I just, I, I feel that, like, though the concerns of the other people are, who have voiced their opposition should be considered, there are so, so many people who I have walked by in my walks to City Hall and whom my bus has driven by, homeless people on the streets, many of them just like me, who cannot be here right now to voice their concern because they don't have the same opportunity, honestly, the same luck that I've had. So I would, I would urge very strongly support, and at the very least, I would urge haste in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to provide rebuttal statements in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and return it to council for comment and action. Councilmember Freeman. Uh, I actually have a question. The approval of this sort of rezone of many, many properties, how, well, we're not, we're not voting on a zone change for the, the apartment complex we've all been reading about out in the Northeast, are we? Uh, no, you're not. Staff appreciates the passions of some of the speakers in opposition, but uh, that particular property that they're concerned about is not being impacted by this rezone one iota. Yeah, well, that, that was really my question, because I think it'll have its own hearings and approvals uh, and because uh, I agree with most of what the speaker said, and good planning has zoning become higher and higher density as you move to the urban core and less and less as you move out. That's just classic. That's the way good planning is done. This way, way out there, uh, I was trying to figure out why would this um, lay the groundwork for uh, high density apartments on the urban edge. And you're saying it really doesn't do that? Uh, thank you again, council member. The concerns uh, in opposition are largely about apartment complex you referenced that is in city in the hills. 
um, that's under a separate application. That, that item has not been heard by the Planning Commission as of yet, so it's not scheduled to your dais at this point in juncture. Back staff continues to work with that applicant. What I would say is that there, if I, if I may, if you look at City in the Hills, all the blue parcels are parcels that are already zoned and staff is utilizing those zones um, as they've been zoned for many, 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 many years. Most of that is single family residential mapping that um, has been kept alive through the prudence of your council's actions. Uh, by the same token, um, the, uh, the state's mandates to provide for affirmatively furthering fair housing does provide for varying densities of development to occur throughout the city. And I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to say that um, all density is focused into the urban core. Um, I would follow that statement up with um, a statement that every parcel that is in this, in this um, rezoning effort uh, has the support of the property owner who uh, responded to staff's uh, request for any anybody who'd like to uh, increase their densities. Now, in reference to City in the Hills, th there are not a lot of parcels in City in the Hills where those, those property owners came out, but there are some, uh, and that speaks to the city's efforts to affirm relief fair housing throughout, uh, and that will be a finding that HCD must make in order for our housing element to be certified. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Weir. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk about this, this big blue blotch out in the in the northeast. Uh, and by by the way, um, their complex is not in City in the Hills. It's directly below Tuscany off Al Alfred Hill Highway. So, give me some kind of idea. All the blue that we see here, and it's all concentrated, that, that development, I mean, it's years away, it, it seems like to me, because there's nothing out there right now. And I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. Uh, most of that, uh, that blue land is single-family residential maps that right. have been approved and are alive and um, do provide opportunities for, for uh, moderate and above moderate development to occur as they are originally entitled to do so. Okay, but I, I'm, I'm having trouble here because on the map, and I, I mean, it, there's a big gap between what's already developed out there and those, and those blue uh, lots, is that, is that correct? I mean, there's there's nothing out out there. There's there's no shopping. There's no um, there's no commerce going on out there. It's it's really it's it's residential. And and that's exactly the purpose of this this rezone to provide for residential development um, that will serve the needs of the community for the next eight years, um, which is to say for the six cycle housing element for the city of Bakersfield. So, um, will it develop in eight years? These lands have been entitled for a long time, and um, we see development occurring in City in the Hills now. And uh, you have a zoning ordinance that you recently adopted that provides for more streamlined processes that would encourage development to occur on these entitled, entitled parcels, uh, perhaps in a more expeditious fashion than has occurred in the past. Um, so, noting that the city's Regional housing need allocation is to produce 37,461 units of various income brackets in the next eight years. And the staff is tasked with finding 37,461 units plus about a 15% buffer. So well over 40,000 units of, of uh, residential development in order to meet that regional housing need allocation as a component of an approvable housing element. So yes, that's a lot of blue. Um, will it build? Well, we challenge the development community to be responsive to that and do just that. Uh, noting that 
uh, I can't compel anyone to build uh, a single unit. I can only provide for the necessary environment for that to occur. Well, I totally understand that, but um, I'm concerned about that area. It's, it's, it's a beautiful area, and we want to, and I want to make sure that it's maintained. And, and when we're done, that it is um, something that this entire city can be proud of. Um, so it, it, as long as it's all residential right now, all that blue. Exactly. Okay. Yes, council member. And so for that to, to really develop out there, commercial is going to have to come, correct? As rooftops come, so follows commercial. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Gray. So, Mr. Boyles, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could clarify with that conversation that you all just had, what is the zoning right now in all that blue? Is it R1, R2? Is it, is it multifamily? Is it a mixture of that? What, it, what, is, what is that blue zoned for right now? It's predominantly single family residential. Single family. Um, most of those maps are approved <coughs> during the building boom. And uh, they, and so consequently, they've been kept alive through the prudence of of the council, and uh, those are available for construction. Okay. You see development occurring um, in and around those blue blotches uh, by various builders, both local and regional builders. Um, I can't specifically call out whether there's some R two in there or what have you. What I can say with certainty is for every one of those blue parcels. They're not under consideration tonight because there's no zone change associated with them. That okay. is, that is existing inventory that we used to illustrate where we were when we started this effort. That was the question that I was trying to get answered. Is the zone change going to be affecting that blue out there in the City of the Hills? It's staying the same then. No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to express my appreciation to staff. I know this has been a big lift, and uh, we want to keep the development community alive. We want to have affordable housing. We want to provide housing for all of Bakersfield. And if we don't move forward, then we lose all of that and and possibly you know the state comes in and, and takes over our housing or or takes away our ability so i appreciate the efforts and uh, i guess i'll make the motion to approve <laughs> thank you thank you council member smith i don't see any other request to speak you have a motion please cast your votes Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item, please. Council and Mayor Statements. I don't see any requests to speak yet. Okay, we'll just give it a minute for it to come up. Council Member Kaur. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so today we had uh, the Lourdes Huerta in attendance, and um, I apo we apologize to her for not being able to have enough public comment speaking time, um, but I wanted to wish her a happy 94th birthday today. So uh, just want to express how lucky we are to have you in the community, Dolores. Your advocacy is a gift that we'll keep giving. And on a personal note, um, you know, I, everything I know about community organizing, I've learned from Dolores Huerta. She was leading community groups um, when I first became a young 
community advocate in Bakersfield and in Kern County right after finishing undergrad. And so I consider myself a, a student of the School of the Lourdes Huerta. And she was uh, never, she never backed down from being a note taker at a meeting. And, um, you know, it was humbling for all of us in the process, but I think that speaks to her legacy, her humility, and her dedication to service. And um, on that note, I hope that uh, Dolores, you'll, uh, I'm sure you're watching at home, but I hope you'll accept our birthday present in honoring the work uh, that you and Cesar Chavez led for us that really revolutionized life for the working class here in Bakersfield and Kern County, across California, across the nation, and across the world. So um, today I am humbled and honored to introduce a joint referral with my colleague, Councilmember Eric Arias, to rename a major thoroughway in the city of Bakersfield in the name of Cesar Chavez. And um, I want to pause to also read an excerpt from an article in the Californian from Robert Price, in which he asked on Cesar's birthday this year. Um, and, and the headline of the article is, Where is Cesar Chavez Boulevard? In the 31 years since labor leader Cesar Chavez died at the age of 66, at least 31 cities in 11 states have seen fit to name a street or other community thoroughfare in his honor. Albuquerque, New Mexico, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, San Francisco, places you might expect to appreciate the man who perhaps more than any other individual transformed the lives of million, uh, millions of working class Latinos are among them. But Chavez's name also appears at major intersections in places you might not expect. Dallas, Boise, Idaho, Salt Lake City, Milwaukee, San Diego, Kansas City, Missouri, Las Vegas, Houston, Lubbock, Texas, and others. And on this Cesar Chavez Day, a holiday in at least six states, including California, that honors the life and legacy of the late civil rights icon, who would have been 97, it's also instructive to note where his name does not appear on street signs. The city that jumps out is the city in which he spent some of the most meaningful days of his adult life. In Chavez's adopted hometown of Bakersfield, he's honored with only a Bakersfield City School District elementary school that opened the year after his death. Before Chavez and the union he co-founded came along, farm workers had no collective bargaining rights and no toilets, heat breaks, or clean drinking water. There was little public awareness about pesticides and other dangers workers face in and around the fields. These are the workers we're implicitly referring to when we in Kern County brag justifiably that we feed the world. Naming a street in honor of Cesar Chavez or any other American isn't just a sign of respect for that person, however, it's a sign of respect for the entire ethnic community that most closely identifies with that person, and it helps establish them as a part of the greater national fabric. I agree and echo the sentiments of Robert Price, and um, as someone who grew up reading to Robert Price's columns, um, again, we are encouraged um, by, by Robert, and um, it also dawns on me that Caesar passed the year that I was born, and so um, it feels as if we definitely stand in the trees planted, we pl stand in the shade of the trees planted by Caesar and Dolores alike. And Caesar is a household name, and we, Kern County, Bakersfield, are known globally by their names, by Caesar's names or Dolores' name. And this is long overdue, but I'm glad we're here today. And um, I just want to take the moment to recognize that um, while it took us a while to get here, as Robert Price has said, um, and as so many community advocates have also voiced, um, you know, Caesar represents the service, the commitment to service, uh, not only as a patriot in serving our nation and being a veteran, um, but also in the spirit and what I think of the Bakersfield spirit and the Kern County spirit. Caesar embodies that, and we carry on that legacy. Um, and so with that, I, I actually want to pass the mic to my council, Councilmember Arias, if I may. So thank you. Councilmember Arias. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councilmember Corr. It's an honor 
truly to uh, make this joint referral tonight. Um, I'm not sure that I've shared this, from, this story from the dais yet, but um, I am part Filipino and Mexican, and on both sides of my family, uh, we have very deep roots in the farm working community and in the agricultural community, just like so many uh, throughout our city and throughout our county. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited to share that uh, a quick story that my uh, great grandmother on my maternal side, Modesta, um, actually joined in many of the strikes and the protests uh, that were led by Caesar and Dolores. And um, while Caesar and Dolores may not know my great grandmother, who's now passed, uh, she remembered them. Uh, and, and they inspired her uh, to not only uh, stand up for what she believed in uh, in a peaceful way, uh, but to advocate for others who were experiencing uh, some very tough and vulnerable working conditions. Um, and so I think, you know, like my colleague mentioned, this is, this is very long overdue. Um, there are historic monuments throughout this entire county, including La Paz, um, and also including 40 Acres, which is uh, home to the very room uh, that Caesar actually uh, spent time fasting, um, working to ensure that workers were protected and had safe working conditions and were paid a fair wage. Um, and I just think that, um, you know, this, while we're doing many things throughout the city, I think it's important that we pay respect um, to those who have come before us. And um, I just want to echo um, the, the referral that Councilmember Core made and also ask that um, staff look into different options uh, for us to bring back to this council and consider um, being that Ward 1 is home to the renaming of the most recent street renaming uh, from Cottonwood to MLK Boulevard for any arterial in, this, in the city. I know that it can be challenging, it can be a long uh, process, and we want to make sure that property owners are taken care of, uh, that their needs and uh, accommodations are, are met. So um, it's truly an honor, and I'm excited to uh, go on this journey and look forward to hearing from community members who I'm sure will um, embrace this idea and come out and support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Arias, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank both Councilmember Core and Councilmember Arias for the referral tonight. I think this is absolutely uh, long overdue. Um, and, you know, in fact, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, tomorrow, Albuquerque, New Mexico, will be celebrating Cesar Chavez Day in a whole citywide event, and this will be their 30th anniversary. Uh, so, uh, to just underscore the point, there are many communities throughout the country, throughout the world, that, are, that have recognized uh, a leader who's in our own, who came from our own backyard. And so I certainly support it. I will also make a referral tonight uh, that staff work towards, uh, in the next budget, uh, work towards an allocation of some funding to work with those property owners who may be affected by a street name change uh, so that we can help facilitate this, uh, this transition and it's a positive experience for everyone. Um, I also recognize that uh, we have not uh, established a uh, public property uh, uh, renaming uh, or name change. Um, and so uh, I'd like us to, uh, name change policy that is, and I'd like us to establish that as well. And I'm gonna make that referral tonight to Planning and Development Committee so that we can begin uh, the framework for renaming other facilities such as parks. Uh, because frankly, I think that um, we also need to uh, look at uh, uh, a special way to honor uh, Dolores Huerta, uh, another uh, one of our leaders who, as it was pointed out today by Councilmember Core, is celebrating her 94th birthday today and is being recognized by world leaders throughout the, throughout the world uh, today uh, throughout social media and in the media. So uh, thank you again, council members, for that referral. I completely support it. And, uh, Thank you, staff, for proceeding forward. A um, couple of items tonight. Sadly, uh, Open Door Network uh, is experiencing significant budget cuts from the state of California uh, through their Caltrans contract, uh, their Adopt-a-Highway contract program. This is their largest and oldest uh, contract that Open Door Network has had. Um, their full-time crew members, uh, many of them, will have to be uh, either uh, laid off or their, their hours will be cut as a result 
of this significant budget cut. Uh, this at a time where over 200 people who are experiencing homelessness or are in our shelters are on a waiting list to, to be part of, to participate in this jobs program. We have people who are experiencing uh, homelessness, who are on the streets, who are hungry, who, are, who want to get back to work. And this wonderful program has been a great entry point for folks to develop their skills, to get back into the workforce, and to move on to uh, better jobs. And uh, sadly, this program is being cut. And so what I'd like us to do, and I'd like to make a referral tonight, that we look at some of our unallocated ARPA dollars and see how we can meet that uh, funding gap, at least for this year and next year, while we still have ARPA dollars remaining. Because I can't think of a better way, a more immediate issue uh, to address uh, than this particular program that's really giving people not just a hand out, but a hand up uh, to improve the, their lives and the lives of uh, their families. And certainly I think uh, Mr. Strackler is going to attest to the quality of this program and the significant impacts to the quality of life to all residents should we see this program uh, cut um, and, and the impacts as it relates to uh, freeway cleanups and just the look and feel of, of all of our city. And so uh, I'm hoping that we can move um, very quickly at uh, finding those dollars and bringing back an agreement with, with the Open Door Network. And then finally, at our Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting, we discussed uh, some priorities. Um, and uh, I don't think Anthony's here, but Mr. Valdez actually uh, outlined four different priorities for the Housing and Homelessness Committee um, for, this, for this next year. Um, and one was really tr trying to provide some more medical treatment and medical care for those, peer th those individuals who are on the streets today. And um, towards that end, uh, I have been in conversation and working with uh, Good Samaritan Hospital and St. Vincent de Paul on developing a concept to establish a permanent uh, medical uh, facility, a clinic, uh, at uh, St. Vincent de Paul. And um, all of the parties are on board. The board, board of directors at St. Vincent de Paul is very excited about this concept because St. Vincent, frankly, is really meeting the need for those individuals who are really are the most service resistant in our, in our community and who need medical treatment, who need substance use care. And so I'd like uh, staff to take this ball uh, forward and I work with Good Samaritan Hospital and St. Vincent de Paul to see if this is a program that we can uh, partner with and to allocate one-time dollars that we may have available uh, through the uh, either opioid relief settlement or other dollars that we can then allocate to, to make this program move forward. With that, uh, thank you all. Good night. I don't see any other requests to speak. Um, I do see that we have the Office of Assemblywoman Dr. Jasmine Beans here. Thank you for supporting this meeting. And with that, we stand adjourned at 731.